cold and cut with precision. They're the meat in our sandwiches and slices of American pop culture. They're the source of long-held secrets and the inspiration for mile-high masterpieces. Very good. Delectable. Delicioso. And dodgy. This is pork tongue and pork snout that has been cooked. Pureed, pumped, or poured. Now, Cold Cuts on Modern Marvels. Cold Cuts. They're cold and they're cut. Whether at the sandwich shop or deli counter, a picnic or sporting event, cold cuts are the ultimate inconvenience food. And they've been that way since they began arriving with European immigrants in the 1800s. They've also become extremely profitable. Every year, Americans consume over $2 billion worth. And although dozens of different cold cuts fill our sandwiches, a few stand out. Some have even become a part of the American lexicon like this one. Farmland Foods in Wichita, Kansas is full of bologna. Every year, this plant squeezes out 60 million pounds of it, enough to make 960 million sandwiches. But what exactly have Americans been putting in their lunch boxes for all these years? The answer rests in these 2,000 pound combo bins. I'm surrounded right here by the meat ingredients that go into a bologna. Right here, we, we have what they call 50 trim. That meat will be 50% lean, 50% fat, and we'll go into this particular combo. From over here, we have the pork trimmings. They'll take a, the trimmings from the loin, from the ham, and this particular meat will be 80% lean, 20% fat. The last thing we have, and the most predominant in bologna, is the mechanically separated chicken. Okay, we know you're wondering. Mechanically separating chicken is the process of removing the remaining meat from the bones of an already butchered chicken. And it comprises 70% of bologna. Named after Bologna, Italy, a town famous for mortadella and other classic handmade sausages, American-style bologna is made with a more modern touch. This is the beginning of the process right here where we start taking big pieces of meat and making them into smaller meat that we can use. They're spreading that meat out. They're inspecting it as it goes down the belt. It goes underneath this metal detector where if there happens to be any metal in the meat, it's detected and we can take it out there. From there, it goes into the grinder. At the rate of 10,000 pounds an hour, the meat is ground through a circular die. The smaller surface area on the meat will better absorb the goodies that make up the timeless bologna flavor and texture. You'll see some uh, salt, you'll see some sugar, you'll see some cornstarch, you'll see some bologna seasoning here, which is mostly mustard. Dump in a blender, ooze in some corn syrup, and the ingredients are turned into a gooey bologna paste. Once the product is blended, it's put into this hopper. It's then run through this vacuumizer where all the air is taken out of the product. It's then run through this last color cutter where it's emulsified, the emulsified mixture makes its final push into thermoplastic cellulose casings. Once the 36-pound logs are spit out of the casing machine, they're clipped and sealed for cooking. The bologna logs are then wheeled to the hothouse and smoked for eight hours until they reach an internal temperature of 165 degrees Fahrenheit. After a chill down in the cooler, it's off to the slicers. At the rate of 920 slices per minute, the bologna is portioned into 16-ounce piles and sent down the line for packaging. But the final bit of work is left for the consumer. As you know, this, case, this particular product is stuffed in a red casing. This casing is inedible. It's put into a package this way, mainly for show, so it looks good in the case. But what you would do before you actually ate it is you would take that casing Peel it away from the meat so that all you really are eating is bologna. The main ingredient for the iconic American sandwich is ready for delivery. And there's no telling where it might end up and how it will be used. 
Elvis Presley was a huge sandwich eater. One of his favorites was fried bologna sandwich, which is still very popular down south. Well, you fry the bologna in a pan, and then you put it in the bread, and then you fry the bread too. The more butter, the better. Well before Elvis tore into his first fried bologna sandwich, Julius Caesar and his armies were chomping down on another cold cut classic, salami. Legend has it the first salamis were made in 700 BC in Salamis, a small village on the coast of the island of Cyprus. Derived from the Latin word sal, meaning salt, salami originated as a way to preserve meat during a time without refrigeration. And those who made it were hailed for their expertise. I think salami, more so than perhaps any other cold cut, really is an artisan food. Really, the craftsman um, ship that goes into it is amazing. At the Columbus Salami Company in San Francisco, California, Francois Vecchio creates Genoa salami with the same passion and recipe as the ancient sausage makers from Genoa, Italy. Here you have a sample of the kind of meat that we receive from the Midwest. The meat needs to be red. We even get whole muscle which are completely peeled, as you see. In the salami, you want to respect that meat all the way through and add to it the little particle of fat that will give you that nutty taste, that will give you the texture and the proper balance for flavor in between the lean and the fat. Shoulder meat and fat from the back of a pig are chopped to size and mixed into the proper secret proportions. Now here you see the fat coming into the bowl chopper with a little bit of lean. Meantime, the operator has put in the meat the starter culture. Now he's putting in the salt and the other ingredients. Essentially, it's salt, sugar, some spice. This is a burgundy wine that is part of the formulation. The process goes on without emulsification at low speed to respect the texture of the meat. Once the salami reaches the right consistency, it's sent to the blender, where it's turned into a paste. Through the blending effect, the mixing, the salt, which is in contact with the protein of the meat, will form a glue that will bind the paste together. Also, will bring the lid down so that we can vacuum whatever air is still included in the paste. Removing the air from the paste keeps any unwanted bacteria from growing in the meat. A critical step for the next phase, fermentation, the process where beneficial microorganisms work to preserve and cure the meat. Once in its casing, the outside of the salamis get a kickstart into the fermentation process with a dousing of penicillium. When the salami comes through that little uh, tunnel, you see that sprinkling. The salami gets coated with the starter culture for the mold. It's all wet outside. The mold is necessary in the process once we go into the fermentation. Here we have a wagon of Genoa salami ready to go to the fermenting room. The salami is warmed inside this 75 degree dripping room. The fermentation process is underway, a critical step for the meat to become salami. Remember that starter culture added to the meat? Inside the salami, the starter culture starts to multiply. Billions of microscopic bacteria consume the meat's natural sugar particles, turning them into lactic acid. The lactic acid coagulates the meat proteins into solids. As the meat dries, the bacteria begin to die off. At the same time, the penicillium mold is attacking from the outside. The mold penetrates the casing, acting as a biological catalyst releasing flavor and aromatic enzymes that give the salami its distinctive taste. Meanwhile, as moisture continues to evaporate, the sausage loses about 5% of its weight. By the fifth day, it looks like this. We're getting to the end. Normally, it takes seven days to dry. In this case, 
The salami is fully formed. The mold has grown everywhere. And if I cut it, voila, I have a salami. The slice holds. It's not ready, but it's delicious. For those who like their meat even firmer, the salami heads for the aging room, where it will hang for up to three months. Once it's dried, it's ready to eat. The salami has reached its full flavor potential, but left alone, it would continue to dry and lose that Genoa salami taste. So after the mold is peeled off, the salami is sliced and then sealed. Columbus Genoa salami is now ready for market. They even make the most expensive type of salami here. It's called Felino, and it runs about $15 a pound. If you like salami, you might like the classic cold cut that rhymes with it, pastrami. At the world-famous Carnegie Deli in New York City, these mouth-watering masterworks have been luring patrons since 1937. The signature sign that's been with us for 70 years. This is a landmark, a trademark. It says the world's best. We have the world's best pastrami right here in New York. Every week, Carnegie customers devour more than 10,000 pounds of the stuff. To make this product is very, very hard and very time consuming. It takes us 14 days from the time that we get the meat, to we process the meat, until we serve it. And that starts at the Carnegie Processing Plant in New Jersey, where every day so-called steer navels arrive to be turned into pastrami. This is where the Carnegie Deli pastrami sandwich starts, right in this room, right over here. As you can see, these navels are very heavily marbled. Um, the marbling means that they're either prime or choice. If we had a lean pastrami, we wouldn't have any flavor. Fat is where the flavor is, we all know that. This navel comes from the section from the fourth rib down all the way down past its uh, belly button. Um, the navel, as you can see, almost looks like a piece of bacon. That's because we call it steer bacon. The navels start their journey in the injection room, where 54 needles deliver a dose of brine. This is called a stitch pump machine, and that's really basically what it's doing. It's stitch pumping through the needles the brine that we make. The brine contains water, salt, and all the special spices that make our Carnegie Deli pastrami what it is. The brine preserves the meat and the red color. You get a nice rosy red color, the same as they treat bacon. If you look closely at the navels, you'll see all the needle marks that have gone through the meat. The brine-filled navels are then sent to recover in a steel tub. For the next two or three days, they absorb the brine and spices until it's time for a special Carnegie Deli spice massage. All right, this is where the magic happens, right here. Uh, we, we've already drained the navels that you saw in the holding tanks in the other room, and now we rub them with all our secret spices that we use. That includes uh, coriander, peppercorn, paprika, and caramel color. And then there's a few in there I'm just going to keep to myself. With their spice coat on, the navels are hung and sent to the smokers, where they're cooked with the aroma of hickory wood. Other manufacturers boil their navels. Four hours later, the navels have graduated to pastrami. Take a little cut off of here. Got all the fat, we got all the marbling. This really looks like a nice prime piece of meat. Ah, the smell, we're gonna let it go to Carnegie Deli. Cooled and crated, the pastrami is off to the deli, where it gets one last pampering in a nice long steam bath. Once the meat comes in, we bring it and we put it into the steam table. Here in the steam table, we cook it for two to two and a half hours to bring all the flavor and the moisture out, and it breaks down the fiber, and we get a product nice and soft and tender, ready to go upstairs, make sandwiches, and to eat it. Upstairs, people from around the world are digging in on the time-honored recipe brought over by European Jews in the mid-1800s. Finishing a sandwich, however, is another thing. Every sandwich that comes out is at least a pound of meat. We don't want our customers to finish. If they finish, we made a mistake. And if they can open their mouth and put their mouth around it, it's a mistake. 
As the tenderized masterpiece makes its final approach, it's held up with care and tradition, all the way to another delighted customer. Look at that smile, all the way from Minnesota. I put a smile on that man's face. Speaking of faces, how about a cold cut made out of a pig's face? Or head, to be exact. Bologna, salami, and pastrami may be the classic cold cuts known to everyone. But now it's time for some more challenging compositions. Fritz Usinger is a fourth generation sausage maker. In 1880, his great grandfather, Fred, immigrated to the United States and settled in Milwaukee, where he opened Usinger's Sausage Company. With him came his favorite European cold cut recipes, including some on the exotic side, like head cheese. To the squeamish, a quick heads up. There's nothing cheesy about it. These are the meats that have been prepared that are gonna go into the batch of head cheese. The ingredients are meats that come from the head of the hog. That is a pork tongue and pork snout that has been cooked, it's been cubed, and then it's gonna be mixed with spices. Head cheese has a loyal following among hardcore cold cut lovers. One with its roots planted deep in the family farm. And historically, head cheese was a product that was developed generations ago when people raised their own animals on the farm to feed their family. The beauty of head cheese is that it, it makes use of all of the meats from the animal. Head cheese was very much a poor man's uh, meal because it was the bits and parts that were less expensive, that could be salvaged. So it was economical, use of all kinds of little scraps and bits that were remaining, but yet kind of had that little nod to the wonderful feasting heads that were presented at the nobility table. In the hands of a capable butcher, the usable parts of the head are easily removed with some precision slicing. Separating meat from bone takes some digging around, but in the end, nothing is wasted. Cook in boiling water, add some salt, and it's ready for processing. It's hoisted into a mixer for seasoning. We're adding salt uh, to the mix right now. Natural spices are, are added uh, to the broth and the cubed pork. And we'll get a nice even blend of the spices with the cubes of meat. Once it's been thoroughly mixed, the mixer will be emptied and the cubed meat will go to the filling station. The spiced head meat is then drawn into a natural casing made from beef intestine. But its chunky composition makes for a clunky tie-off. So the sausages are hand-tied the old-fashioned way. They're now headed for a bath. In this room, in these large vats, we water cook the head cheese. We cook it at a water temperature of 200 degrees for approximately two hours until an internal temperature of 160 degrees has been reached. At that point, we start chilling the head cheese in cold water. And after an internal temperature of 40 degrees has been reached, then the head cheese will then go to the cooler for further air chilling. As it cools, the broth solidifies into a jelly around the meat. The pig head parts are now a mosaic of Usinger and cold cut history. Fritz Usinger says it's called head cheese because it's molded like cheese and its shape resembles a wheel of cheese. Those who belly up say the taste is rather complex. So it is um, a chewier product and it has more mouthfeel than, than a normal emulsified cold cut. For something a little smoother, there's always the centuries old German creation, liverwurst. Liver has always been a rich man's food. The origins of liverwurst are back to the nobility. There's only a little tiny liver in every animal, and it's prized. It was always eaten first when it was fresh. At Usinger's, the livers are always fresh, thousands of them, just waiting to be added to some pork and then ground into a paste. The pork livers and ground pork have been combined with the spices and the salt. Now they're gonna go through the uh, emulsifier machine and we're gonna puree the ground pork and ground liver to make an emulsion. The emulsified liver and pork is dripping with vitamins, minerals, protein, iron. 
and a bit of cholesterol. Put it in a casing and the livers are a worst. The emulsion is pumped into the casings under vacuum to avoid any air voids in the product. The sausages are in three pound sticks and they'll be water cooked to an internal temperature of 160 degrees and then rapidly chilled. The liver's moisture makes it soft. Aficionados use it either cut thick or as a spread. For those who want something a little less exotic, there's always this classic, olive loaf. It starts gently enough with lean beef, ground pork, and a touch of flour. To those meats, we add ice, and the ice keeps the meat cold during chopping. The knives during chopping create a lot of friction. We don't want the meat emulsion temperature to rise too high, therefore we add ice. Round and round it goes. When it stops, it looks a lot like bologna. The, the meat went in ground, and now through the uh, bowl cutter, it has uh, been uh, made into an emulsion or a batter. So the meat is very uh, soft and uh, almost cake-like. A proper olive loaf is crafted as much for aesthetics as it is taste. To add both, manzanilla olives are delicately folded into the mix. We're running the machine slow right now so that the olives don't get cut up. We want the olives in whole pieces so that the olive loaf has a very nice picture when it's sliced. So we get a nice distribution of whole olives within that slice. Here, the blend takes a diversion from traditional cold cuts. This is where the loaf part comes in. Olive loaves are really made like meatloaves. What we're doing is we're stuffing them into a meatloaf pan and then we're gonna oven bake the olive loaf to an internal temperature of 160. After a nice browning in the oven, the olives, pimentos, and meat have risen to complete another using her favorite. Ordinary or exotic, round or square, cold cuts manufacturers have crafted something for everyone. But now that we have the cold, it's time for the cuts. Careful. Sharp it is, I mean, ouch. At the nearly 5,000 Quiznos sub shops across America, cold cuts are turned into warm cuts. Every year, 13 million pounds of turkey and 5 million pounds of ham are sent through the distinctive Quiznos toasters. But equally important to Quiznos' success is the hardworking hero moving back and forth behind the counter, the slicer. There's no cold cut without the cut. We call it thin to win, that's our saying. You know, we want to have nice, thin slices. You take your thumb and your fingers and you rub slightly and it just starts to break up. But as you can see here, we have whole slices. And that's important for the uh, consistency of the sandwich. The Quizno slicers come from the Hobart Slicer Plant in Richmond Hill, Georgia. Every year, Hobart assembles and ships several thousand slicers to delis around the world. Manufacturing begins when aluminum slicer bases enter the polishing area. This is where we start the polish process of the casting. The backbreaking work required to polish out the rough surfaces is necessary to reduce any harborage areas for bacteria. 80 grit belts and fine sand coated wheels smooth out most of the visible crevices. For the hard to reach areas, the base tumbles around in a bed of steel beads. Now what happens in the burnishing is these millions of bearings in here hit the surface of the base and makes it even a smoother process, makes it a smoother finish. The base is then sent through a protective oxide spray and put aside to wait for assembly. In another section of the plant, the rest of the slicer parts are fit together with as few seams and joints as possible. More protection against bacteria. But the star part, the blade, is getting its own polishing in a separate area of the plant. It starts as a 3 8 of an inch thick piece of sheet metal. A diamond cutting wheel makes it a knife. Next step in the process of uh, making a knife is sharpening the edge. So after it comes from flapping and machining, uh, Tina loads it on the sharpening machine. And this sharpening machine will take the edge down to about 10 thousandths of an inch. 
So it's not, not quite as sharp as we want it, but nevertheless, it gets it ready to go on the final product. Add on the protective blade guard, and the slicer is almost complete. Once the half horsepower motor is in place, all that's left is some fine tuning. You can see, Joe, that he's already uh, assembled the knife and he's adjusted the gauge plate. And the next part that goes on the machine is this uh, top cover. Once the top cover is done, he will also put the uh, sharpener on it. The Hobart sharpening stone is made of cubic boron nitride, one of the hardest materials known to man. This is basically guaranteed to work for the life of the slicer. It will go on um, until the uh, slicer is done. The blade is worn out. Before they have a chance to wear out in the deli, randomly selected parts are tested in the lab to determine their life cycle. This process here simulates reasonably excessive uh, application and the use of the switches. So we try to put it through some vigorous testing here. At this time, these switches have been run for uh, uh, 1,115,000 uh, cycles. And we intend to take that up for several million. But before any slicer leaves the plant, it has to pass the scrutiny of Big Tim Griffin. Tell him, test the sharpness of the knife for these post-it tabs. When I run the carriage across the knife, I want two out of three of the tabs to fall off. That's a good one. Pass on my inspection. Of course, when the slicer goes into action, it will have to be cleaned around its sharp edges. To make this safe and easy, Hobart has developed a solution. We use this tool to remove the knife from the machine, like so, and the knife comes up in it. The edge of the knife, knife is protected by this tool, and the, the blade does not come off. It's secured in there, and this knife now can go to a sink to get cleaned or to a dishwasher. Hobart owes a nod of recognition to butcher and novice engineer Willemus Van Berkel, in 1898, Van Berkel took a blade and mounted it next to a moving carriage. By 1907, his patented slicers were being used around the world. Emilio Mitadieri is passionate for the old Burkels. He restores them in his San Francisco shop. I am so baffled how they really put together these machines and how they move. They move with elegant simplicity. Many collectors consider them works of art. This is a Model 3 Berkel from 1905, maybe 1907, more or less. And you can see that the big wheel moves the a small wheel and moves the carrier like a bicycle. Van Berkel's design is ingenious. Once the meat is positioned on the carrier next to the blade, the operator turns the wheel. The wheel turns a set of gears that move a handle attached to the carriage. At the same time, a second set of gears turns a shaft attached to a chain which turns the blade as the carriage moves back and forth. Van Berkel's idea to move the carriage instead of the blade is the same design used today. The sharpener is also the model for modern slicers. Gently, you move it up there. Um, one or two, three passes, gently, and it's done. At that point there, you, you, could, see, you could feel the blade, how really sharp it is. I mean, ow! Yep, the sharpener works. Okay. I'm okay. I've done it this before. Burkle knew his customers wanted options. A thick or thin cut was just a turn of the knob away. So here is this classic cut, so presata, that it needs to be cut thin. And at this point, you can see there that it's getting really close to do it. And here we are. I want you to see it, you know, how translucent there is and uh, how beautiful it is. Mmm, delicious. Delicioso. The Burkle may have been poetry in motion, but breaking it down to clean was cumbersome. In the 1950s, manufacturers came up with a way to prevent the slicer from becoming the slicee. Uh, the carrier that he holds the meat, uh, it was removable. So that was fantastic because, you know, you're able to put him in a dishwasher or wash it by hand and, and, and able to put it back as easy as I put it on there. So. Uh, there you go, and you're ready to go. The 1950s also brought a new demand for convenience. 
in the 1950s, then, you know, motors were applied to these machines, so you didn't have to crank anymore. All you had to do really was turn the switch on. The motor may have been the death of the slicer as performance art, but who's making sure there's nothing alive in your turkey sandwich? That is an art in itself. Every year at the Butterball plant in Mount Olive, North Carolina, 3,000 employees process 12 to 15 million turkeys, over 50,000 a day, into one of America's favorite cold cuts. And it starts with, well, turkeys. Making cold cuts on such a grand scale requires meticulous attention to sanitation. Our top priority is food safety. If you look at all the different procedures that we go through, all of them have to be perfect. You only have one opportunity to be perfect. The quest for perfection begins the moment employees arrive at work. Before every shift, they must don freshly laundered smocks and sanitize their hands to reduce the risk of transporting bacteria into the plant. This is where the process begins. It begins with a pass through the boot scrubber. Only then can workers proceed to their stations. We're now in the raw area of the plant. What's behind me right now is our shackle line. At this point in time, what you're seeing are turkeys that are coming down the shackle line that have been run through the basic processing area or the area of evisceration. And they're now being transported into our debone area for cut up. The turkey carcasses are carved into sections. Breasts head down the final trim line. We'll remove any connective tissue, blood, or bruising from the wing joint area of the breast lobe. We then use a process called peeler rollers. We simply roll the breast lobe on the rollers. That helps remove any excess fat, skin, and again, break up any connective tissue that might cause toughness in the product later on during consumption. The breast load then continues to travel down the line to the final trim station. As you can see here, this lady has removed the breast load from the line and she begin the process of final trim. At final trim, excess fat, bone, cartilage, and any blood material is removed and discarded. It may look like a mess now, but every night the final trim line empties and the sanitation crew trots in. At, at midnight tonight, this will be a ghost town. From 12 to 6.30 the next morning, all this equipment that you see will be broken down. Our sanitation crew will come in, apply chemicals, hand scrub, rinse, sanitize, and within a six hour period, this equipment will be reinspected and reassembled for production to begin the next day. Why such an effort? to guard against two main bacteria, Listeria, a nasty organism that attacks the immune system, and Salmonella, the stomach-wrenching organism found in many animals. Moving on, the freshly carved breasts are weighed and then sent to the injector, where the watchful eye of the United States Department of Agriculture is never far away. When I do my inspection in here, I look for temperatures of the meat coming from the coolers in here. I verify that the brine is at the right temperature. I verify that they have the right ingredients. Similar to making pastrami, the needles inject a brine solution of salt, water, and phosphate to create moisture retention, and sweeteners like sugar or honey for flavor. The turkeys are then vacuumed through a plastic tube to a stainless steel massager. Inside the massager, the turkeys tumble for about three hours. As they bang along, the brine is evenly distributed through the meat. Simultaneously, the salt draws the meat's natural proteins to the outer surface. As you can see, the meat has a very tacky, a very sticky look to it, a waxy appearance. That's what you look for, that tackiness is a sign that you've done a good job in extracting protein, again, through vacuum and through mechanical action of massage. The sticky breasts are then weighed to spec and placed two to four at a time inside a plastic pocket. During cooking, the extracted proteins will bind together to form one super breast. The breasts are nested in cooking bags, 
then racked and sent to the oven. When they emerge, they will enter the segregated, ready-cooked side of the plant. The important thing about the, the separation between the raw side of the facility and the fruit side of the facility is cross-contamination. It's a good, uh, good manufacturing practice that the company split the two areas to avoid uh, the transit of food contaminants from one area to another. Getting to the cooked side means a change of smocks. Employees and camera crews must then wade through a soap and water-filled basin. An iodine solution kills bacteria on the hands. Arm-length plastic gloves complete the ensemble. It's now safe to rejoin the bagged birds on this side of the plant. Then we have associates begin to unload the product from the belt, which is the first step in the process of removal of the cooking bag from the product. The product travels by way of conveyor into the cooking bag removal area. Here we have our associates using a knife to score the plastic to begin the removal process. Then they remove the cooking bag from the product. As the cooked turkey breasts are freed from their bags, the knives are periodically sacrificed in the spirit of sanitation. Each morning, these knives are set out new, and at break time, they'll actually dispose of that knife and begin to use a new knife when they come back from break. That way, we don't carry any contamination over from one period of production to the next. The breasts are showered with either a liquid hickory or caramel flavoring, and then conveyed through a wall to packaging. Humans take a different route, and another preventative step against bacteria awaits. We're walking into the vacuum packaging room. You'll notice on doorways that transition from one area of the plant to the next, or one room to the next, we have door foamers where we're laying down uh, a layer of flat sanitizer to help create segregation from one room to the next. Meanwhile, the cooked breasts have been vacuum sealed and are about to enter the shrink tunnel. Product moves into a hot water shrink tunnel. Water temperature ranges from 195 to 205 degrees. During this process, the bag is shrunk down to the product so you get a nice, tight, snug fit of the product. Product is then loaded into a surface pasteurizer. Inside the surface pasteurizer, the breasts move through hot and then cold water. When they come out, they're free of bacteria. The factory is a different place at night and the haunt of the sanitation police. It's four in the morning and the entire production floor that would be normally running food product has been disassembled. The sanitation crew has come in, they've done a, a soap and, and water rinse and then they've sanitized it. So as you see here, she's got a, a high intensity light and she's using her hands to rub across the equipment. What she's looking for is she's looking for oil residue or any type of buildup of oil from production or from food. Swabs are randomly taken from equipment. Some are sent to an on-site lab where they're checked for listeria. Others go to a second lab and are checked for salmonella. If these bacteria are spotted, may they rest in peace because the line will shut down until every last microscopic organism has been destroyed. The turkey breasts will find their way to the delis and sandwich shops of America. There, a visit to the slicer turns them into cold cuts. Talking turkey, there's another cold cut slicing into the competition, one of the strangest concoctions in the deli counter. Can you say, tofurkey? It's a cold cut without the meat. For a quarter century, the Turtle Island Food Company in Hood River, Oregon, has been cooking up loaves of tofu and seasoning them to taste like cold cuts. But it's the tofurkey, turkey made from tofu, that's turned Turtle Island into an $11 million a year tofu empire. Turtle Island produces 1.2 million pounds of tofurkey every year. And it owes its success to tiny soybeans that have been cooked, pressed into milk, and coagulated into cake-like blocks called tofu. And that's how it arrives at Turtle Island. The first step is to turn it into a liquid. Here is the wonderful magic ingredient of tofurkey, the tofu, which is blended and liquefied and ready to be pumped down into the tofurkey mixture with our 
Speller pressed canola oil, and our non-genetically modified soy sauce. Downstairs, the liquid ingredients are combined with spring water from nearby Mount Hood. And with the dry ingredient that will solidify everything into a gel, wheat glue. Now for the taste part, or at least as much as Turtle Island is ready to reveal. We also have the Colonel's secret recipe. The ingredients are spices and plant extracts and proprietary stuff that we can't tell you on camera. <laughs> Last but not least is the lemon juice, which acidifies the tofurkey and lowers the pH level of it. After blending, the mixture becomes a kind of tofu goo. This is very jello-like in, in a sense. It's like a, a gel at this point. It's very smooth in texture. You can see around the sides here how smooth that is and shiny. It's very pretty. And then on the inside, when you tear it, it's starting to strand. At this point, the tofurkey will take no shape. It'll just take the shape of whatever it's squeezed into. That would be a round plastic casing. Wheel it into the oven until it's cooked, into the chiller to solidify, and then it's time for a quick inspection. We're checking to see if it's done. It's cooked all the way through, and it tears apart very easily into these nice chunks right there. And it's very good to eat. Yeah, this is delicious right now. Very good. As is, this is the famous tofurkey loaf that changed the way vegetarians enjoy Thanksgiving. For cold cuts, it's a quick pass through the slicer and into a vacuum sealed package. Turtle Island claims tofurkey delivers the same amount of protein as turkey, but with less fat and no cholesterol. After it exits the heat tunnel, there's a quick temperature check and another batch of healthy tofurkey is ready to leave the plant and head for the supermarket deli section. There, we'll join the products of several traditional cold cut manufacturers who are also getting into the health food game. Products like near fat-free chicken and turkey bolognese, turkey salami, vegetarian soy-based alternatives, and even artificially flavored spray-on cold cuts are finding room on supermarket and deli shelves. But most prefer biting into the real thing. Still, whatever you choose, vegetarian or meat, fermented, compressed, or congealed, sliced thick or sliced thin. Very good. Cold cuts are sure to have a permanent place at the table as America's ultimate sandwich filler.